So the big one is the ASAPI properties. which is full of documentation itself. I believe in, a, in a PHP, I believe it uses an XML file, um, but everything should be pretty much standard across all the languages as far as the configuration itself goes. So I mentioned earlier the concept of using the reference implementations or using your implementation. Changing what you're using and changing what gets called is as simple as changing right here in the configuration. You write your implementation adapter, which I'll show you in just a minute, and then you change what we're calling. Everything in ASAPI happens through what's called the ASAPI locator, which in my code, is this guy right here. Whenever you wanna do anything with security in your code. It's very simple to call to the same place every time you get the API you need. So we've got the encoder you've seen. Well, what if I wanna do a login? Well, I grab the authenticator. What if I wanna do logging? I grab the logger. Everything is accessible through the locator class. The locator class is configured through the SAPI properties file and when you run your application, it knows, it, 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 it's set up so that there are some things that are, are uh, what's called singletons, if you're in, in development, where it just calls out this existing instance that exists somewhere in, the, in whatever your uh, container is. Then there's also the um, construct a new class flavor of it. Um, anybody interested in the internal mechanics of how it actually works, I just rewrote it, so feel free to come up and talk to me. Point being here is that there's a lot of APIs accessible, and they're all accessible through the ASAPI locator. So as you can see, if you're a developer, I think this looks a lot easier than trying to remember, what is that class called in Spring Security where I go to log in? Uh, I run into that a lot before I, before I started using ASAPI, especially where you've got lots of libraries. Now, let's take a quick look, maybe, thank you. I want to take a quick look at how, the, uh, how you can actually implement your own version of one of the ASAPI controls. So I've got two things here. I've got the mock authenticator, which is a really basic, simple authenticator that really just outputs something to the console. Doesn't really authenticate anything. But to illustrate how easy it is to do, it's perfect. So we, we have um, an authenticator interface. This enforces a contract for your calling code that says, these are the things that the authenticator does. Um, we've got one for each one of the APIs. The encoder has one, access controller has one, all of them have an interface. On some of these, we've gone so far as to say, well, you know, in a lot of cases, the code is gonna be the same. We're gonna be doing a lot of the same things regardless of what our implementation is actually using. So some of these actually have an abstract class in front of them that defines the, what, what I like to call cookie cutter code. Leaving you with only the responsibility of implementing what you need to for your specific implementation. So as you can see in this one, I've overridden the login functionality. Login simply creates a new mock user, which I'll show you in a minute. The user is responsible for logging in. This is kind of an important concept in the ASAPI. The user is the state of the visitor to the, to the web application throughout his entire time in the web application. As such, it's his responsibility to know, by his I mean the object, it's, it's the object's responsibility to know whether it is a logged in user, an anonymous user, whether he has a valid CSRF token, which 
um, is probably going to become more and more important as time goes on, given some of the presentations I've seen today. So all the authenticator is doing here is saying, hey, I've got a user. He wants to log in. Go try and log him in. And here's where you get to see my ultimate coolness. This is my uh, login query right here. And anybody who's been doing programming for more than five minutes can tell right away this is a really, really bad thing to do. And it's done this way on purpose. Um, not all languages have bind variables for SQL queries. And the projector just turned off. Apparently not. Somebody go get me a virgin. <laughs> I think the projector actually turned off. Okay, well, this could be a, a really interesting way to uh, finish off the presentation. But uh, let's see. So where, let me uh, see if I can get everything back on my screen here so I can see where I was. That's going to be interesting. Anybody have any questions so far? There are, yeah. So a couple of quick things I want to call out about the reference implementations. Um, most of them are what I would consider production ready. However, um, there are some things that we can't make production ready for you. Um, so we've got some reference implementations, primarily things like the authenticator, which are very, very simplified. We actually, the reference implementation uses a file-based um, authentication and so it's you know it's a lot it's very similar to like uh, the password files on a Unix file system it's built the same way chances are you're not going to be using that in your application however things like session management um, CSRF management um, encoding output encoding validation uh, logging all those things are production ready we've also got an intrusion detector and WAF baked into the uh, into the enterprise security API that I don't use them. However, I know a couple of people that are actually a couple of big uh, government agencies are actually using them to the best of my knowledge. And um, from what I understand, they work very well um, right out of the box. They're rule based just like anything else. The one advantage I think you've got to having a WAF in your application, level, application layer is that you've got more context to the runtime of the application itself. Um, so you can probably make some more important decisions in your application firewall than you could in, say, you know, a, an appliance sitting out on the network before it gets to the application. Um, beyond that, the reference implementations are provided primarily as a means to show you how to use the API. Um, so yeah, I, there, there's definitely some things. We've actually talked about making things like the encoder and the validator, not reference implementations, and just part of a SAPI. Um, anybody who's ever tried to write output encoding, it's hard. <laughs> and there's a lot of gotchas. <clears throat> and we've actually got a pretty pretty full gambit of output encodings we can do. We can, we've, we've got all the HTML, HTML attributes, CSS, JavaScript. Um, we've got output encoding for OS commands. Um, tons of different kind of um, environments where you'd want to use output encoding. So um, that one I would definitely recommend using.